Um, I adhere to the Steve Rostead rule of slides, so you're going to be seeing a lot of slides go by very quickly. Uh, do not freak out, they'll be posted. Okay, but open source is pretty much everywhere. And to illustrate this, let's consider something we want to be safe, a car. More of the components in these cars these days are built on open source every year. It, we've seen it start with AGL and the, for the entertainment systems, but it's moving more and more into the drivetrains, more and more into the safety critical aspects. So they're likely to have cameras now embedded on them to help the driver see backup and side views. There's also radar sensors to measure distances and provide alerts when you get too close to another object. This information helps keep the driver and the passenger safe. So far we're in the traditional embedded space, but in addition to the proximity information, you're also going to see dashboards that are incorporating navigational assists that help the drivers get to the destination faster using GPS technologies and communicating with external services to understand how things are like your traffic conditions. And again, this information keeps drivers and passengers safe and helps you arrive at your destination sooner, so it's all a good thing. But and as we're moving towards autonomous systems, the LiDAR and the other sensors are now being incorporated. And there's also the need to filter this information and react appropriately to what you detect. And so if you don't have the human evaluating the input, as it's things you're training these AI models. And you are working um, to get these with connected sensors to actually start to look at data sets to how this all fits together. Um, you know, these inputs from the multiple sensors need to be coordinated. And the data training sets are going to be really key to making sure it recognizes the right things. So all this information is going to be needed to keep the driver, the passengers, and the pedestrians around the driver safe, because that's a two-ton piece of hardware. So what are the ingredients for a modern car? Now we're no longer just hardware and software. We're also trained data sets, and we're communication to remote services. So all of this stuff is sitting there, and we have effectively ways of starting to summarize it, but they aren't talking to each other. And so we can't reason about them. So let's take a look at what's happening in the industry right now. There's an AI incident database out there that's open to everyone. And it looks at what was happening. This is from 2023. These are some of the instances I pulled down for self-driving cars. And three of the four are Teslas. So I'm going to focus on the first one. And if you look at 550, which is that first one, we get a link to the full story on the Washington Post. And they did a really good piece of reporting on it. Basically, it contains concerning information such as not recognizing school bus signs. It's not being trained to handle interactions with motorcycles and emergency vehicles. There's, been, there's now over 8,000 vehicles on the road with autopilot capability, OK? And almost half of them have had to be recalled to fix recognition of things like traffic lights, stop signs, and speed limits for the autopilot and driver assist. And so we also know from Tesla's press they're running Linux on these cars. So there is safety aspects being used here, even if we're not, you know, when we're designing Linux, thinking about it. And the other thing is, in the last year, self-driving capability expanded from 12,000 to over 400,000. And um, two-thirds of all the reported incidents last year were from Tesla because of that expansion, because uh, other car makers are doing a little bit less aggressive of a rollout of the technologies. And then Tesla recently tried to eliminate uh, one of the radar sensors for economic reasons, i.e. shrink down the cost. And they found the crashes were too high because the model couldn't compensate. They actually didn't need that center. And so they reintroduced it back into future products. And they hopefully have turned it back on on those who have it. So from a self-driving car, there's more ways things can go wrong now. We've got the hardware, the software, the data, the communication services. These are all ingredients. And they all need to potentially play a role of interacting with each other to understand if you're going to be safe or if there's a vulnerability. Can you fix it? But this isn't just in cars. Consider your, you know, your operating room in a hospital these days. Um, an increasing portion of these devices are also running open source. And failures could have an impact on a person's life. And one of the things that we're seeing is that the uh, FDA is recognizing this. And this is why there's been a big be um, push behind the SBOM initiatives, um, basically trying to expect to see system level information. So not only the SBOM, but the device and the related systems before things get deployed and get the approval to be deployed. And this is also there sitting in um, critical infrastructure. So the critical infrastructure today um, needs this transparency. And they're using open source throughout a wide range of it. So what we need to start looking at is, OK, how can we start to manage risk and ensure the safe usage of interactions, all these ingredients, including the open source? 
So not just, you know, the, like, the Linux kernel is, you know, one commit an hour of a bug fix, right? Um, these systems and so forth, you know, are, you know, it's a different impedance mismatch, and we have to watch out for the safety side of it now, too. So Japan, um, two years ago, two and a half, well, in mid-2022, basically recognized for cybersecurity action plan, you need to focus on the safety profile. And so the question became is how? How do we do that? Well, there are standards for safety critical systems that have been around for 40 years. And they know how to minimize and mitigate system faults. And part of the challenge is gonna be that the S-bombs are gonna be used to improve the, um, what's known. The transparency of what's known is what S-bombs are conveying now. And so you'll be seeing more of that happening. And today, when people are doing the analysis and trying to apply a security fix, it tends to be a lot of those types of spreadsheets and paper files and everything else. And we need to automate this. We need to get it faster so that people can actually do the relationships to understand how things are interacting and can we have safe usage. We need to be system systematic about it all. So we pretty much need to start thinking from a software bomb to a whole system bomb. And I, certainly on the hardware side, they're used to bomb concepts for a long, long time now. So there's no surprise there, but we're not talking the software bombs linking to the software, to the hardware, linking to a firmware, linking to various versions of everything. And so these all, all these ingredients need to be considered. So getting standardized metadata in the supply chains is gonna be the big challenge. You know, what software's learning on hardware, specific hardware, what components are the dependencies, you know, the software training models, if that's in there, what are the data sets, evolution, risk. You know, we need to have a clear understanding of the service APIs. All of these are pieces that are, could have an impact on the safety as well as the security. And we also need it to be accurate, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, and because we want to start catching the information when it's created. You know, when you're designing something, keep the information there. When you actually put the sources, build the sources, all of that information is accurate when you're sort of working with it, but trying to discover it afterwards is really, really hard. So there's work going on to basically, you know, support generating these S-bombs when the facts are known, at least. And we're lining up pretty much what's, what's been going on from CISA um, with some standard definitions of what this means for a, a type of S-bomb, what sort of information should be in there. And one of the other projects I work with is SPDX, and we've been evolving the framework to be able to connect these, the metadata about components, processes, requirements, and evidence, so we can actually do product line management. And it was announced today we have SPDX 3.0 out, and so that is actually the, our starting part for being able to do this analysis at scale. Um, we've got the notion of various profiles that are affiliating with type of knowledge domains, like software, obviously, like AI and ML models, like data set. You know, if there's sensitive personal information, you want to record that, because that's another factor of a risk. And then we're going to be extending beyond to pretty much um, basically be going in the SPDX 3.1, looking at um, what's happening with hardware. Looks, what's happening with services, operations, and then finally having a true safety profile so we can automate all this. You're going like, okay, we can automate all this? Well, actually, I think we can. Um, there's a broad, these, in SPX 3.0, we've got the core and software licensing in light, and that's what we had in 2.3. And we added in the AI data build, So we, because in safety, we have to understand how everything was built. The supply chain is critical, as well as the security, because we need to understand are there vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities, et cetera. So we're sort of moving in that direction, but we have to connect these components. And in SPX3, we have a wide set of relationships for connecting one component to another component. And so this is basically, we had requirements of, we had specification of, we had it for two, three, we're carrying it forward. So we can start to hook the requirements in with the code, in with the tests, in with the evidence. If we can start to hook these all together, we start to have something that we can automate, put into a database and a knowledge graph so we can be querying it. So, SPDX3 is pretty much extending beyond what we've got and bringing in things like being able to do digital twins, FPGAs, how can we have the other hardware? And there's various external services. So you'll be seeing things emerge there, and if you're interested, we can talk more later. But it does support the modularity and the relationships that we can get this knowledge graph going. And if we can start getting knowledge graphs going in companies, uh, so that when they're having to remediate, they can also spit out the S-bombs that they need at a time, as well as do the analysis for their safety cases. And the way something like this could work, and then I've been working with some of the, um, Nicole, who's been my partner in crime on this one, um, to basically say, oh, these S-bomb types, there's information there for the safety cases that we want to use. 
which then lets us actually go and actually mo be model into evidence that we can start to work from, which then lets us look at, oh, we've got a design S bomb, we've got a safety case. Oh, hey, that gives you information and the specification for you know, your, your um, coding guidelines, which are part of your requirements and so forth. And so you can use these relationships to hook things together. And then you know, what you've built, you've deployed it, you've tested it, you've got evidence. So when there's a bug, and you know there's a bug in your binary, you start to have a way now to basically figure your way out. You know, did it come in from my um, supply chain? Did the bug come in from my source code? Oh, it came in from the source code. Did it come in from the coding guidelines problem? Or did it come in from uh, my requirements? And this starts to let us actually trace back how we can figure out where the real problem is. And that's what's missing today. And we can take within a, a code base, we can actually go and do requirements um, within actually a component and actually start to map the requirements to the code to the test. So we've done some prototyping of this um, by logging things through in Zephyr historically. And we're working on toward to get this going. And the nice thing about if we can get this requirements going to the code to the test, suddenly when you can say if there's a bug, you can actually be explicit and know there's a bug. And you can say which requirements it came from, or potentially do we have to create a new requirement, new tests, and create the evidence and satisfy your safety case. And so this is a way we might be able to finally get after automating safety profiles. And so this also means you know, one, one piece of code may participate in multiple requirements. We can trace that too. So how do we establish this with open source projects? Well, there's four projects I'm working with here at the Linux Foundation that are taking parts of it, OK? Um, the Elisa project is working with Linux. And we're trying to increase um, how we can work with the difference between a kernel that changes nine commits an hour and a safety community that is expecting maybe one commit update a year. And there's a variety of working groups tackling aspects of all of this. And basically, we're focusing on the Linux-based systems, and we are working forward from that. There's a systems working group that's putting together a reference system in the open because everything in safety happens behind closed doors and NDAs um, out there, or a good part of it, anyhow. And they're busy putting together Linux, Zephyr, Zen, and y with Yocto. So we have a reference build of everything that we're doing in the open. So we can start to analyze the system cases, look at the SBOMs, things like that, prototype it. And that open integration is certainly all part of it. And uh, we start working forward from there. The other thing I just want to highlight is Red Hat just open sourced um, last year this tool called Basil for requirements tracking. And what it's trying to do is um, look at the requirements of the kernels and start to hook everything up. And so if you're interested, there'll be a talk on that to, on Thursday. And um, Luigi and Gab are here to um, talk about what's going on with that tool. And so we'll be looking at that and using that for Linux. The other project is Zephyr, where the Zephyr's mission has been to, right from the start is about safety and security for resource-constrained devices. And Zephyr is basically trying to focus on going after initial certification for 61508 cell 3 and 2626 2A cell D is on, the, is on the horizon potentially as well. And so we're basically defining a limited scope for the kernel and then trying to get that traceability going. And with this project, we're using a tool called StrictDoc and looking at a hierarchical structure of requirements for the project. And there's work going on for satisfying the requirements. And StrictDoc is working to import and export from SPDX, as is Basil. The third project is Zen. And that's bringing um, virtualization everywhere. People are familiar with Zen for hypervisors. It also is neutral governance and so forth. And today, what's happening is Zen is working to improve their coding cell with Miser C. And it's implementing various features. But the project members are also working on getting Zen certified for 61508. And they're using Open Fast Trace as a tool. And they're trying to align to use SPDX. So eventually, we'll have SPDX going in and out of all these tools. And so that we can start to hook up all up together as a system and import these SPDX systems for the system, say, oh, I'm using the Zen. I need these requirements. I can hook this together. So that's kind of how it's going. And then we've got Yocto, which is actually creating a reproducible build system already and is fairly commonly out there for most of the embedded space. I think we've got a lot of Yocto fans here in the audience. And so we've got. Um, SBOM, SPX23 SBOMs already with Yocto. And it's been there for a couple of years. And we're participating in the creation of the SPX3 build profile for the things that they wanted. So 
with that, we've got Yocto support sitting there. They've been working on the product line system bomb with SPX3. It'll be rolling out um, you know, sometime in the next year or so. And so Joshua Watts here, and if you get a chance to chat with him, he can give you more details of the plan. So those are the projects I know that are sort of trying to tackle this and put this together in a full system. And these are the pieces that are going there. So, you know, integrating this open source efficiently into system engineering is overdue. Um, there is a path forward, but obviously a community is going to be required. And um, one of the things <laughs> Greg has been very clear to me about his, uh, you know, don't expect the upstream project maintainers to take the load here. We're going to need a community of people, and hopefully we'll get the maintainers to review what we're creating and to get the evidence uh, available so that other people can share it. And so the next steps in the discussion, we've got a safety critical software summit on Thursday. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, please attend some of these talks. And then there's various, um, oops, we got a thing, but uh, We've got various project links. I will be uploading these slides after I get to my computer. And um, you're welcome to join any of those projects and their safety groups, or join the SPDX project if you care about the safety profile as a whole. And with that, that's kind of what I had to talk to you about. I'm a little bit over, but hopefully I'm close. <laughs>